covering the four different perspectives, four different views on the end times. And uh, again, as I've expressed before, these are the major views because um, underneath each of those are, are different subsets. For instance, if we were talking about dispensationalism, we could talk about at least a half a dozen different varieties of dispensationalism. So when it comes to these end times perspectives, these are broad. Uh, they vary somewhat. People's opinions and views will vary somewhat. Um, when we talk about these four major perspectives on the end times, you have premillennialism. One is dispensational premillennialism, and the other is historic premillennialism. And then we also have all millennialism, which is what we, be, we will be talking about today, which is, which means all means none or nothing or no literal thousand year rule. So all millennialism is the belief that there is no literal one thousand year reign or rule of Christ, that it's symbolic. And there's also post millennialism which we will get into um, later. But um, concerning each of these, the major differences in all of these comes down to, with the exception of one, they lean heavily on symbolism, or uh, often people will say, instead of just calling it symbolic language, they might call it apocalyptic language. So in other words, we don't take it literally because it's apocalyptic language, therefore uh, it's all very symbolic, very nebulous, very difficult to define. So we don't know exactly what these terms mean. We don't know the numbers can mean um, something symbolic and not necessarily um, what it expressly says literally. Now the exception is dispensational premillennialism, which will take a more literal view of uh, the scriptures, particularly particularly uh, the book of Revelation, uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, for instance, and not read a lot of symbolism into them. Now, again, as we've expressed before, when we say literal, we're not saying, uh, the, the example we gave is, he covers thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou rest. Doesn't mean that God is big bird or big chicken. What that means is, is we can understand that by reading it normally, that it is symbolic language about God, um, like a large bird, an eagle, uh, a chicken, whatever, a number of birds that, that do cover and protect their young under their wings. And this is what the author of that psalm was expressing, was God's divine protection. We understand this because with a normal reading, we know that that's symbolic. So, with a literal perspective, symbolism is clear, where in the context it demonstrates itself to be clear. Um, beyond that, if we don't have precedence for understanding it to be symbolic, then we just read the text as it is, read it normally, understand it normally. Um, another example I like to give is, if in the book of Revelation you're reading along, and it tells you about a great red dragon, that has uh, seven heads and ten horns, we know that there is no such creature on the earth as this is expressed as being on the earth. There is no literal creature like this on the earth. And so we understand that this is symbolic language, particularly when if you keep reading the text a few verses down, it tells you that it's symbolic and here's what it means. So we take it literally, not reading that as a literal red dragon, because the text says it's symbolic, and contextually we can tell it's symbolic. We look for the words as and um, like, and those can be um, textual cues that we are seeing something symbolic. Eyes like a flame of fire, feet as bronze, uh, a, a tongue as a two-edged sword means those are symbolic because it's like it and it's as it. Uh, so we can use some textual cues like that to tell as well. So, uh, without further ado, 
we will get into amillennialism, which is the, the perspective that there is no literal thousand-year rule. What is amillennialism? Amillennialism, as we've said, is the belief that Jesus will come again someday, that there is no literal thousand-year rule by Jesus Christ on the earth. So, um, as we see here, there is the uh, millennial period, which is kind of expressed um, as a really long period of time and not a little thousand years as we would read in, for instance, the book of Revelation chapter 20. Chapter 20, um, a good half dozen times, talks about a literal 1,000 year reign. It says 1,000 years. The dispensational premillennialist, the futurist, will read that as it says a thousand years. It means a thousand years. Again, taking it a literal and normal perspective. Um, all the other perspectives, whether it's historical, amillennialism, or postmillennialism, they will all read that as well as symbolic language or it's apocalyptic language. A thousand doesn't mean thousand. So what we're in right now is we're in the church age and this is God's millennium or the kingdom age because um, symbolically as the believers and the church we're all part of God's kingdom therefore the kingdom is here right now. But before I get ahead of myself um, the millennium again symbolizes Christ's reign in the lives of his people from the beginning of the church until his second coming. And then after his second coming, we have a, a judgment, all the judgments, everything is all at once. And um, then we go into eternity future. Also, uh, Christ's triumph over Satan through his death and resurrection in about AD 30 restrained the power of Satan on earth. So when you get into the end of the book of Revelation and it says that um, Michael stands up, Michael is loosed, and uh, Satan is cast to the earth, and then after, after the end of the tribulation period, Satan is bound in chains for a thousand years. That's all symbolic, um, of course. But uh, Satan is bound right now for a thousand years. So there's some questions we have about that. There's some difficulties with that. And um, we'll get into that in a little bit. But that's what they believe is that Satan is bound right now. Uh, persecution of Christians kind of is the tribulation period. So tribulation, um, depending on the amillennialists, will believe it's either a literal seven-year period or not that Daniel's 70th week is not necessarily Daniel's 70th week, that it's just things are going to get bad toward the end, and that's tribulation, that's, that's difficult times as they get into the end, and then we'll kind of um, come into where things are, depending on the perspective. Some will believe that things get worse and worse, but at some point, at some um, undefined point in the future, Jesus Christ will return on the earth. Others believe that um, things will just get better and better and better because, um, you know, as uh, God's kingdom on earth, and we represent that, that our influence is salt and light in the earth, are going to improve things, and things are going to get just uh, so great it's going to become Jim Dandy. And um, finally, we will eventually end up with kingdom on earth, and that's uh, more of a post-millennial kind of thing. But there are some amillennialists who kind of take kind of a slight different spin on that too, but I won't belabor that. So what is amillennialism? Persecution of Christians, tribulation, will occur until Jesus comes again, as will the expansion of God's kingdom or the millennium. That's how the millennium comes on the earth. It expands as more and more believers on the earth. We will have times of troubles and tribulations on the world. I don't want to, I don't want to go off down that road too far and, and parse that too much at this point. There are variations of these, as I say, um, also, when Christ returns, he will immediately defeat the powers of evil. Um, speaking mostly of the nations, governments on the earth, wickedness on the earth in general. He will resurrect the saved and the unsaved. He'll judge 
judge them all, um, and then deliver them to their eternal, their respective eternal destinies. Okay, and that happens at the second coming of Christ. Um, once again. So, what does this view emphasize? Many all millennials believe that the book of Revelation consists of seven different sections, and that these sec sections are not uh, interpreted as successive time periods. In other words, the, the order of events as they occur um, will not necessarily be in the order that they're written in the book of Revelation. Um, there are some issues with that we can discuss um, because anytime, as we've pointed out before, anytime that you get into symbolic language, you, you're potentially dealing with um, many difficulties where it comes to deciding who gets to determine what the interpretation is. It symbolizes something. Who decides what the symbol means? Who decides when the symbol is fulfilled and how it's fulfilled because it's symbolic? So it leaves it wide open to very broad interpretation. So anytime we stray away from just what the scripture says and understanding it directly what it says, we say that it's, it's apocalyptic language or it's symbolic or it's allegory or something like that, then, then well, we've, we've got some issues that we have to deal with. So it's very difficult. What does this view emphasize? Rather, the seven sections describe the time of Jesus' first coming until his second coming in seven different ways. So the book of Revelation will kind of express uh, the turn of events in the world um, from the time of his first visitation all the way until the second coming. Um, again, I want to jump in there and express what some of the problems are with that, but I'd rather do that later. All millennialists tend to emphasize the historical context of Revelation and what the book meant to first century readers. So according to this view, the Great Tribulation represents disasters, wars, and persecutions that have occurred throughout church history. Most references to Israel in Revelation are symbolic references to just in general the people of God on earth. And often they would like to use passages such as Galatians, Galatians 6.16, which says, And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So they will look at a verse like that and say, see, um, you know, this has to do with the church, so you know, um, this passage here has to do with the Israel of God, therefore everything kind of gets lumped under that umbrella. Okay? According to this view also, in Apocalyptic literature, numbers represent concepts, not literal statistics. Um, so numbers will mean various different things. Here's, here's some examples that they will use. Um, six symbolizes incompleteness, right? Because seven is completeness, six is false short of that. Ten symbolizes something that is extreme but limited. 12 represents the perfection of God's people. 1,000 symbolizes a great amount or a long period of time. So, what scriptures support this view? The Bible frequently uses the number 1,000 figuratively. They say frequently. But here's, here's one passage. I can't really think of too many others, but here's one passage. 2 Peter 3.8, where it says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. The first resurrection could refer to, could, the spiritual resurrection or the regeneration of new birth of persons who trust Christ. Now, why are, why are we getting around to this? Because the Bible talks about two different revelations, or resurrections, rather, not revelations, I'm sorry. So you have the first resurrection, you have the second resurrection. So how do you have them both happening at the same time? And why isn't it just the resurrection? So it's difficult to, to kind of take Romans 11 and say, no, 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 we'll pay attention to the rest of those verses. Let's just focus on verses 13 and 15 here, that the first, first resurrection has to do with 
uh, the regeneration of the new birth. It's very difficult to do that. It's, it's fraught with issues, but we'll get into more of those. Um, what scriptures seem to support this view, again, is the second coming of Christ and the resurrection of the saved and the unsaved will occur at the same time. Um, they will maintain, and they will get that from John 5, 28 to 29. John 5, 28 to 29 says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So, the saints are on earth during the tribulation is another reason why they will support the view, because um, they'll say that that uh, we are here during the tribulation period. And therefore, there is no literal, there, there is no literal um, uh, millennium period, and tribulation does not mean what we think it means. So they will point out that there are saints on the earth in Revelation 13, 7. All right. When has this view been popular? Amillennialism became popular in the 5th century. Amillennialism has remained widespread throughout church history. Prominent Amillennialists include Augustine, possibly the first amillennialist, Martin Luther, John Calvin, E.Y. Mullins, Abraham Kuyper, G.C. Burkauer, I'm probably butchering these names, Herschel Hobbes, Stanley Grenz, and J.I. Packer. Uh, it's important to understand how it came about was in the uh, early days of the Reformation, uh, men such as Luther and Calvin and others coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they came out seeing, translating the scriptures, for instance, and seeing the error of the Roman Catholic Church and what they preach with workspace salvation and so forth. And so what their concentration was um, within the realm of soteriology, which is the study of the doctrine of salvation. And this is critical that all souls would be um, come to a knowledge of the Savior, uh, to Jesus Christ, through faith alone, by grace alone, and not by works, lest any man should boast. So, in trying to correct false doctrine, in trying to correct theology, and correct the the saints of the church, the believers, and to try to bring about reformation to the Roman Catholic Church, this is where they concentrated their efforts. They did not concentrate their efforts on what you'd call more more of the fringe doctrines on the out, outside circle. You've got toward the center, the bullseye, salvation. Things have to do with the doctrine of God as well. Things like that. And so when you get to things have to do with eschatology, which is end times teaching, it's not as critical that we get that right. And also, it was so far outside of their field of thought because, um, again, that's how they would look at it as apocalyptic language because, wow, when you start reading the book of Revelation, particularly in their day, and trying to comprehend what it's talking about, um, very confusing, very difficult. It's easier for us today because we're closer to that time period so we can kind of comprehend um, some of the things it's talking about. I mean, how do you have the two witnesses, the two witnesses being slain in the streets and the whole world watching, the whole world watching as they rise up on their feet and then they resurrect um, you know, on the fourth day? How, how does that happen? How can you even comprehend that? Well, nowadays we would understand that. I mean, since about the 1980s with satellite TV, we understand that. And, but but today, people with their cell phones standing around, you know, holding them up, so that, you know we can see the um, different events in the world. It's real easy to see how the whole world would see the two witnesses stand up and and resurrect. So it, it was so far afield of their thinking that nobody was really thinking in terms of in times, especially when the critical issues of salvation have to be addressed. 
And frankly, they didn't get that far. I mean, whether it's William Tyndale or whoever, um, they were imprisoned, they were being tortured, and ultimately they were being uh, martyred for their faith before they ever got a chance to get that far. So kicking that can down the road, what happens is is that people look at the Refor Reformers at the Re during the Reformation, they look at the Reformation period, and they look at the teachings that they brought forward, the things that they wrote on, and and many didn't really express a change in particular in their perspective on the end times. So they brought with them what they had with them coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, and, and those ideas didn't really change. They didn't have a chance to reform their eschatology. So eschatology needs a reform, reformation as well from what the reformers um, brought forth. Well, in, in uh, uh, and dispensationalism, we believe that that is kind of a reformation in that. It's a rethinking based on a more literal perspective of the scriptures, and that's my in my humble opinion, the best way, the most accurate way to really read the scriptures is uh, read it normally, uh, or read it um, for what it says. Take it for what it says on face value, more so than just relegating it to apocalyptic apocalyptic uh, literature. So, the Reformers were all millennialists for that reason, and so the 500 years since the Reformation, um, people who follow Reformed theology for the most part haven't, haven't varied from that. There have been a few that have through the years, um, and until uh, about the 1800s, it became more popular to look at other perspectives. Now, there's always been um, uh, premillennialism. There's always been a pre-tribulation rapture, and it's been taught since, you know, I, I could argue from the scriptures, but since then we have writers outside of the scripture, as we've covered in within the first couple of, the, of videos of this series, that have expressed um, the tribulation period as a seven-year period and premillennialism and so forth. So it's always been there. Well, what they taught during the Refor Reformation is the five solas, sola scriptura, and that's scripture alone, the Bible alone is our highest authority, sola fide, faith alone. We are saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Sola gratia, grace alone, we are saved by the grace of God alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone, Jesus Christ alone is our Lord and Savior and King. Sola Deo Gloria to the glory of God alone. So that's who we live for, and it's for God alone. So it's not Mary, it's not the saints, and so forth. These are the things that they're concentrated on during that period, again, because of salvation reasons. But next time, next series we cover will be post millennialism, and that is that Christ returns after the millennium. So there is a literal millennium that Christ returns after it. And uh, but before we get there, we are going to address briefly in the very next video what some of the problems are, some of the difficulties with amillennialism, and why a person and many others do not uh, follow amillennialism. We know that some of us might have reformed soteriology, we might follow that kind of system when it comes to salvation, but not where it comes to eschatology and some of the reasons why next time. Again, much of this is covered in this book right here. You can also see the back of it. But uh, this is available on Amazon. Again, it had a pretty good run on the Amazon Kindle bestseller list. And uh, about 450 pages if you want the Kindle version. Graphs and charts inside of the in color. Uh, otherwise, if you want to print, you're like me, that I can feel of a book and smell of a book. Um, it's going to be all the charts and graphs are going to be, uh, the graphics will be black and white. But it's up to you to do both. So, until next time.